And Gavin starts from Amy. Tell us how developers can drive change. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to see that so many of you actually made it this morning. I was expecting maybe three people, uh, and then we could have just gone around the corner for a coffee and had a chat. And um, what I'd like to do today, and I did change this presentation entirely at about five o'clock this morning, because um, I was out as late as the rest of you. Um, and I thought I'd just actually talk about the story of Amy, because um, we've been through quite an evolution over the last few years, and I thought it might be useful to share some of our experiences, the ups and downs, and how we've navigated trying to create change. So the, the title was, How Do We Create Social Change? I think it's, it's all kinds of change, it's global change, of many, many different types that, that we're codifying the world. We used to build things, well we still do, but we used to build things with kind of bricks, and steel, things like that. We now build things with code. Uh, Amy's specific thing, just to give you an idea of, of what we do, it's a nice, simple diagram here. Aggregate the world's environmental standards into a single standard API. Um, the world of environmental assessment is largely governed by spreadsheets and PDF files that are, as you all know, completely useless. So we, a third of Amy, well there's 18 of us, a third of Amy are PhD scientists, a third of our team are uh, software engineers, and they built a platform and they take all of this information in to the point now that there's 8 million th things in Amy that you can footprint against. And businesses need the access to this information. Governments need access to this information. Individuals need access to this information. So we've tried to try really hard to make it as easy as possible to engage with. And we started off day one by building an API because we thought back in 2006, we thought everybody's going to be using APIs within minutes. Uh, that took a little bit longer and it's still taking a little bit longer. So we had to think, how can we make this more mass market. So we started building search engines. So we built a, a, a first search engine a couple of years ago, but it was too complicated. People still needed a lot of domain knowledge to work out how to use it. So we just launched, uh, tail end of last year, a new type of uh, computable search engine that enables you to do computations in the search uh, query. So here, you can search for 42 kilowatt hours of electricity in the UK, and it'll tell you the carbon footprint of that based on the different methodologies that exist. You can do the same thing with 100 kilograms of apples, or 1,000 miles in a Mini Cooper, or uh, 10,000 miles in a 747, um, and able to try and work it out for you. And it's very early days for this, but I'm extremely excited about it because it really starts to bring this alive for, for many, many more people. And at the back end of this, as I say, there's a whole bunch of APIs. We've got an app kit that we used to develop, uh, app, mini apps, very, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, Chris here, who's sitting in the audience, um, built a Foursquare integration in about five days, was it, I think? Um, started at the company. Uh, we thought, well, we'll give them a nice, easy job to start with. Could you build a Foursquare integration with Amy uh, in five days, please? Um, and that just looks at where you've checked in makes this set of assumptions and give and emails you with your footprint. So really trying to sort of bring this whole area alive. So that's kind of broadly what we do. Uh, what I'd like to talk about now is, is our journey. How do we get here? And it takes a long time, uh, a painfully long time. So I can't believe this is 2012, but in 2006, I wrote a white paper for David Miliband when he was Secretary of State saying, wouldn't it be a really good idea if we had an API to release government data with? Um, and the data.gov stuff was just sort of brewing there, so we, we helped to provide an example uh, of that. So DEC, uh, Department of Energy and Climate Change, was our first customer, and we provided an API for a national campaign, uh, and within six months, we'd measured the footprint of half a million homes in the UK, uh, everybody just piling into a website to self-assess. There's this little diagram which you can't see very well on the right, but it's a little heat map of the UK uh, based on age of appliances. So we can tell how old your appliances are based on your geolocation. The older the appliance, the less efficient it is. Uh, the younger the appliance, the more energy efficient it is. So if you want to replace a whole swathe of appliances in the country, you can use this information and maybe 
you know, not build a new power station. That would be a, that would be a good outcome. 2008, uh, we were extremely fortunate uh, to raise some money uh, with uh, O'Reilly Alphatech Ventures. So Tim O'Reilly uh, came on board with uh, Union Square. Um, our usage climbed. Uh, we got to about a million people using the, the platform uh, for their footprinting. Uh, and we scaled, started to really scale our, our data aggregation. When we first started, we maybe had a, you know, 10,000 data points or something that you could footprint. And we started scaling that up, and over the years, we've taken that up to 8 million. Uh, but that's still only the, only the beginning. And then 2009, uh, there was emerging climate policy. You had Copenhagen. So we started to bridge out into building solutions for companies. Uh, we got corporate users like SaaS and business objects on board, uh, really broad range of users, lots of API keys out in the wild. Probably about, by this time, it was about 1,500 API keys out, out in the wild. Uh, so 2010, we added more money, uh, which is great. Amadeus, uh, Herman Hauser, and co. Uh, we scaled our data aggregation further. Still only 18 people or so in the company, 18 to 20 people. Um, we looked at emerging markets. We brought more standards together. Uh, we saw a proliferation of standards. The whole thing was kind of really starting to, to motor. Policy was looking like it was going to come in in Australia and various other parts around the world. Um, and we added real-time function as well, so you could start putting in smart meter data directly uh, into some of the AMI systems. So um, that was a you know really kind of ascendancy type thing. It was taking a long time. It was had its you know ups and downs along the way, but the trend was, wow, this is really going to make a difference. Up until 2010, this is the rate of change of the number of people signing up to AMI compared with the previous year. Right, so this isn't just adding the number of users; it's saying, you know. Real growth here, real acceleration. This gives you a sen sense of the acceleration of, of the growth. So we had a, a big spike around uh, sort of early 2009, and then a bit of a dip over the over the summer, and it really started to sort of ramp up again uh, at the end of 2010. Would you mind setting the number? Oh, uh, yeah. The, the scale on the um, left-hand side here is not to 200. So we're getting maybe. 20 people a week signing up. Now, this is an environmental data API with no marketing, right? So I wasn't expecting us to go like down the Twitter billion API calls a minute kind of routes. So, but you know, getting 15, 20 people a week signing up to this API, great, I'm really delighted. So what then happened in 2010, um, all the climate policies collapsed. Uh, pseudoscience made it a real play for reality, uh, you know, with climate gate and all the other kind of uh, bits of nonsense that were happening. People really started to question the policy in the US started to go backwards. We thought it was going to be slow, but we thought it would actually move forward. Didn't, didn't even stall. It started to go, to go in reverse. Um, the market stagnated. Smart meters looked limited to a kind of form of advanced billing than anything actually useful. Uh, certainly not anything aligned with the Internet of Things. Uh, and the global recession kicked in. So um, that had a few implications. So looking at that rate of change graph uh, again, um, went somewhat the other way. So we were still adding users, but at a much slower rate. So we stopped accelerating and we decelerated. So still adding maybe five or 10 people a week, which is great, but nothing like what was happening before. The little uh, graph up here on the, on the right is a, a Google Trend search for climate policy. And you can't really see it on the screen here. There's a big spike there which exactly aligns with this. So um, there was lots of talk about climate policy, and then the whole thing just fell off the edge of a cliff. So we, we've mapped. You know, I had the same thing with my Twitter followers. We had the same thing with API calls. We had the same thing with API signups. And we had the same thing happening in the media. So this was kind of a not good thing. So we had to, to inhale a little bit <laughs> and breathe. And this was a really tough time for us uh, and many other companies. If you look back around that time, there might, be, might have been 120 companies starting up in the enterprise carbon accounting space. I'd say 80% of them don't exist anymore. It was brutal. So classic early adoption stuff. We're very familiar with it, uh, but no less painful. So um, we had to radically adjust how we're going to solve the problem. The problem we're trying to solve 
is to get everybody, every business, every person, every government, engaged in trying to address, quantify, measure, and reduce their emissions. So how do we make this relevant? And of course, we're data geeks. So our thinking was more data. How do we get more data to solve this problem? Um, now, I don't say that glibly. It's, it's how do we really make this relevant, more and more relevant, and start to span other areas where everyone sort of in the carbon space said, oh, now we're energy efficiency companies. Well, that was a bit lame because it just started to ignore the underlying issue of why you're doing this in the first place. Everyone started to focus in on cost savings. Now, these are good things. These are things that you can go and talk to a CFO about. But if you're trying to kind of wire up this data ecosystem, you need to take an approach where you can sort of bridge these, these things. So as uh, James was saying, I replaced myself last year. So I moved to Amy's chairman, and I brought in a new chief exec. The chief exec that I brought in was the guy who used to run Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet is the biggest credit rating agency in the world. And Tim grew that from I don't know, a billion dollar turnover to $10 billion turnover. So not really your classic internet startup guy. But what he brought to the business, and what, is, what he is bringing to the business, is all of the links into the financial systems that we just couldn't uh, have created. And so what we're doing now, looking forward, is a number of things. And I'll just walk through a few things. Firstly, we went free, completely free. We were always free for people who wanted to do cool stuff, but we went properly free. To try and drive usage, extend uh, how many people could engage with us, reduce all barriers to entry we could possibly think of. How can we take away every single piece of, of barrier? So we used to charge, or at least do some form of scoping exercise around how many API calls somebody might make, or what sort of data they wanted to do. We just got rid of all of that, and it's free. And if you want a service level agreement, you pay 350 pounds a month. That's it. Unlimited calls, unlimited data, whatever it is. Take away every single barrier we could possibly think of. We've launched a university program to try and get more re research and data flow into the system. So it was actually something we built into Amy three or four years ago as we had a kind of wiki type approach where people could publish their own data. But that doesn't fit with the corporate space. You need quality assured information. And our team put all of the information in Amy through a really rigorous quality assurance process so that people can trust the data. And trust and credibility are fundamental to making this stuff work. And I think that's, that's a trend and all of these things, I, I see patterns in what we are doing and all other forms of ma uh, big data aggregation that is going to be used by businesses and governments. We need to start raising the bar on the quality, the veracity of that information to make it more and more relevant. Last weekend, we ran a, a green hackathon at uh, UCL. Uh, we had 130 people register. I was completely blown away. We had 80 people, well, 80 to 100 people turn up uh, and spend two days hacking away. And the quality of the results was exceptional. Uh, the energy of the people who were there was exceptional. And there are a few trends that I, I'd like to pick out. Most hack days that I've been to, uh, to do with energy or green stuff, you, you tend to end up with a lot of developers who don't necessarily understand the sustainability space. And so you have this kind of Venn diagram of people who understand sustainability and not tech, and technology people, and they don't understand the sustainability piece. And there's a tiny little Venn diagram uh, overlap in the middle there, which is kind of where Amy is right now. So we put a lot of effort into bringing domain experts to the uh, event to help set the agenda, help steer the projects. And we also had people come to the hack event who were not technologists at all. We had people coming with ideas. They would then find a developer and build it. That's something that I think is very difficult to achieve in a hack event. But I was delighted to see that happening in, in more than one instance. One of the, uh, well, the, the winning projects after the weekend was a green cloud broker. And I thought, you know, this is a real trend of clean tech meets web. How can we bring these two areas together? Because in my view, we won't have clean tech unless we have good web with lots of APIs letting us share data. 
And we probably won't have a web unless we have the clean tech piece because our energy costs are going to go through the roof. So we've got to bring these two things together and they can work much um, more cleanly together, much better together if we start to fuse together these two systems. We also got the government to back uh, the hackathon and uh, one of the outcomes there was um, Biz and, and the Cabinet Office have been looking at running their own hack dates. So they were using it as a bit of a test. They were extremely happy by the end of the two days. They came along, saw all the finalists, saw the winners. Some of them may go on to get additional funding. But my belief is that government will now start running its own hack dates based on the success of this kind of event. What else are we doing? Well, I'm now, well, is everyone familiar with the My Data initiative in government? Anybody not familiar with it? Okay, a couple of people. So yeah, it's part. They're just not raising their hands. <laughs> uh, come on. People okay. Don't know what the fuck my data is. Okay, so My Data is a government initiative led by the Cabinet Office to open up more consumer data. So one of the flagship uh, components of that is the Energy Sector Board, so, which I'm now part of. So I sit around the table with most of the energy companies in the UK and the cabinet office and which magazine and you switch and all those kind of guys. And the objective there is to mandate that every single smart meter and every single bit of consumer data to do with electricity consumption is made open and addressable via um, APIs or uh, is made machine readable. All of the utilities have in principle agreed to this but we're currently navigating the, well, you can already get your information as a consumer because you can log into our website and download a PDF file. So the conversation there, you can all imagine what that is. Well, we'd quite like an XML feed or at least a CSV file, and we'd like it to be machine readable. How many of you support OAuth? You know, that's the kind of conversation. But this conversation is happening at cabinet office level with all of the utilities around the table. So directionally, that is meant to be happening. The question is, how quickly can we make it happen? And the more we can demonstrate how easy it is to do, the faster it will happen. We've started to match financial, company financial data to environmental data. And here, our objective is to just footprint every company. Uh, and it sounds, uh, might sound kind of crazy, but again, Tim comes from a company where they've got financial information for 200 million companies worldwide. Um, we um, got hold of data for half a million companies for the hackathon in the UK. So half a million UK companies. So that's company name, full address, including postcode, turnover, sector codes, uh, etc. We can combine, we're now working on combining that financial information with the environmental information so we can create an implied environmental score for every company. So we really want to move the dial on this uh, space. <laughs> and, uh, building the future. Here. Yes, we're building the future and, and they're coming in to get us. Um, <laughs> the purpose of that is to reveal the environmental risk, is to reveal the environmental risk in people's supply chains. And this is a huge thing that's kind of trending at, at the moment. It's being driven by the sustainability folks inside companies but it's actually going to start to cross into really relevant uh, financial uh, metrics in a very short space of time. The other thing we've did, done is uh, try to move right the way into the product design uh, space. So here we have an integration with Autodesk uh, where you can draw your object, you can draw your product, you can assign a material to it and it will do a call to Amy and calculate the footprint of that material at the design stage. Now that's important because 90% of the product's footprint is baked in at the design stage. And if you don't fix it at that point, you're pretty crippled in trying to fix it later on. Now, you can kind of see a trend here, and it's going to take a very long time to get there. It's taken us five years to get this far. But if you start getting this piece right at the design stage, and you can link this piece together with the, the supply chain, Ultimately, you can start really looking at what is the resource availability in a particular territory at a particular time and what you should you be designing at that moment in time in order to maximize the resource efficiency uh, of that uh, product. 
That's a kind of long-term vision. It's not going to happen anytime soon. But we've already demonstrated, again, proof of concept stage. For example, with a coffee factory, we could look at the real-time energy mix, whether you're on-grid, off-grid, what the transportation was, what all of the resources were in the production line. And as the products come off the factory floor, every product has a label on it, which is the environmental footprint of that product. Not a bag of coffee, but that bag of coffee. So you can drill right down to the individual resources of that one thing. This is my expectation of what we're meant to be building when it comes to opening up all of the data, putting sensors everywhere, bringing all of this stuff together, is the Internet of Things for me provides, or, or sustainability is, if you like, a purpose for the Internet of Things. It's uh, something that can really facilitate and enable us to move forward. Results? Well, this is what's happened in the last few months since we've changed our approach. We've gone through our nice growth period at the beginning, went through our dark, dark, dark phase, and now it's picking up again. And what we need is for everybody to engage, not just with us, this isn't a pitch for, for Amy, but we need everybody to engage in this space. We need everybody to start putting APIs on every single bit of consumption, activity, resource consumption that exists in every system, because it needs to be addressable because we will come at some point and ask you for that information. So please bring data, more data, always more data, and let's hack the planet back. Thank you. Awesome.